Come now. Touch the withered arm and travel to the realm of shadow. I will not be far behind. May we meet again. Christmas flame. So a couple months ago, Elden Ring Shadow of the Earth Tree released, and I have been extremely excited to play it. However, I wasn't really able to do that since I was occupied, to say the least. But now that I haven't jumped off a cliff, I remembered saying that I was going to take a break from hard games for a while. I lied. I I couldn't wait to dive into the Realm of Shadow and see what Miyazaki and his team cooked up with this expansion. But the thing is, I haven't played this game in two years. This presented a huge problem. No way was I going to play this DLC by ear. A DLC expansion apparently so difficult, it has completely reignited difficulty discourse again. So I did the logical decision of starting up New Game Plus in order to refresh my skills. I beat every main remembrance boss, beat the game again, shoutouts to the Elden Beast for not being complete garbage this time around, and committed to the best ending, the Ronnie ending. I love my wife so much. With my sauce reacquired, I headed back to the cocoon of the Empyrean, spoke to Letta, then touched Mikola's withered arm and entered the Realm of Shadow with no prior knowledge. I'm gonna take you guys through the entirety of Elden Ring's DLC in order to see whether or not a Kingdom Hearts Pro can beat Elden Ring Shadow of the Earth Tree. Now that we've entered the Realm of Shadow and made it to the Graveside Plane, we've got some things to address here. More specifically, the two Darkmoon Greatswords in my possession and that these are basically my primary weapons. You might be thinking that this is suboptimal, not good, how in the world did I beat the game this way? And my answer for that is, it's fun, and the power of bonkage brings me immense joy. Is this the best way to satiate that desire? Not really, but I gotta rep Ronnie in the best way I can. Let me rock. Oh, and by the way, I don't intend to use summons mainly mimic tier at all for this run of the DLC in case you were wondering. For now, it's time to assess how I'm actually going to tackle things and spoiler alert, I did things in maybe the weirdest order so be prepared for that. Of course, I picked up the nearest map piece, got absolutely decimated by this furthest golem, and decided to leave him for later as I went past this gate and came across two NPCs, Ansbach and Moor, as well as this cross. These crosses are actually Mikola's crosses and can be seen as Mikola's footsteps, detailing how at these locations he'd abandoned a fundamental part of himself, whether it be pieces of his flesh or what have you. It's also near these crosses that you can find Shadow Tree fragments. Apparently this is the correct way to say it because Body Vidya said it like that in the video and far be it for me to argue against them, right? But these Shadow Tree fragments are essential for any playthrough of Shadow of the Earth Tree, as collecting enough of these fragments will help you raise your Shadow Realm blessing, increasing your defense and attack against enemies and bosses. So exploration is definitely something to prioritize rather than simply just heading to the next objective. From here, I spoke to Ansbach and more, with Ansbach detailing how he was once a pure blood knight who served Moog, the Lord of Blood, but has since come into the service of Mikola and intends to use his time in the Land of Shadow to uncover his true intentions, while Moor is this cute little guy who sells us stuff. After making some new friends, I pushed forward and entered the first dungeon of the DLC, Bellarat, the Tower Settlement. For a first dungeon, this place is awesome, and I got lost several times trying to explore every nook and cranny of this place, even coming across another poison swamp. Why does Miyazaki like these things again? But eventually, after exploring enough of the Tower Settlement, I made it to the stage front, where we encountered the first major boss of the DLC, the Divine Beast Dancing Lion, and it's a pretty cool first fight. For starters, I love how this is in reference to the Chinese Dancing Lion, a dance performed in Chinese and Asian culture featuring two dancers operating from inside of a lion costume, and the same applies here. However, per its namesake, these divine lions were said to be from a higher plane of existence and acted as messengers of the gods. 
By donning these costumes, the people of Bellara were capable of manifesting the Divine Beast's power by acting as vessels, and the one we fight here is one of the last remaining dancing lions as most of them were made extinct by the crusade of Mesmer the Impaler. But enough about the lore, let's talk about the fight itself. Most of the lion's attacks consist of different types of bites, stomps, and headbutts, and will even surround its feet with deadly mists. However, for this boss and most bosses in the game, the key to victory is actually to stay very close and keep to its left or right hip for the majority of the fight, and most of its attacks are pretty well telegraphed, especially when it tries to stomp on you or bite you from the air. Obviously, as you can see, my main source of damage is through jump attacks with my two Dark Moon Greatswords, as like we've established, this brings me immense joy. Once we've depleted about 75% of its HP, we enter into Phase 2, and this is where things can get extremely tricky. During Phase 2, the Divine Lion will call upon the power of the elements, utilizing fierce lightning, raging tempests, and chilling blizzards, and can switch between the three at will. Out of the three elements, the one I find the most difficulty dealing with is the lightning phase since when the lion attacks, you need to perform two dodges instead of one, and the reason for this is because each of the lion's attacks during this lightning phase leave behind streaks of lightning that will strike after a couple of seconds. Also it's here that the lion gains the ability to literally toss bolts of lightning from its hands and it's extremely fast. Compared to this, the wind and ice phases aren't as difficult, because during the wind phase, the lion will generate a giant tornado, but this is very easy to react and dodge roll through. And in the case of the ice phase, the lion's biggest move here is that he can perform hoarfrost stomp, but either a well-timed dodge roll in its face or a well-timed jump from further away will keep you safe. Once the lion starts getting desperate, this is where he'll start shifting between all three of its phases and attack in quick succession, and this is really hard to react to, but once I had gotten through this part of the fight, I was able to show the lion that although its dance was beautiful indeed, he could not match the pace of an Elden Lord. Also for beating the lion, we even get its head as a reward. This thing is so stupid looking, I love it. But from here, I proceeded onward until we reached this door, which was covered by shadow, barring us entry. We also found a note here from Leda, detailing that beyond this point lies the Gate of Divinity, the place where Queen Merica became a god, and by extension, the vessel of the Elden Ring, and that Mikola's goal is to reach the Gate of Divinity himself in order to ascend to godhood. She also details that she intends to follow the path of Mikola's crosses set east. So eastward is where we're headed next. On my way out of Bellarat, I came across the Horn Scent Grandmam, and by putting on the Divine Beast head, she gets the impression that we are a vessel for the Divine Messenger ourselves, tasking us with getting revenge on her clan, the Horn Scent, the people of Bellarat who were called in Mesmer the Impaler's Crusade. Once I was officially out of Bellarat, I came across another cross, as well as two new NPCs, the Horn Scent and Freya. While Freya is an honorable warrior who once fought alongside General Rodan in his glory days, the Horn Scent is the polar opposite as he is another survivor of Mesmer's cruelty. He states that though we may be temporary allies joined together by Mikola's compassion, we will ultimately never be seen as worthy of Mikola's grace in his eyes, yet in spite of this, he gives us a map detailing where to find the next set of crosses. Although east is where we should head next, I decided to get my run back against this furnace golem, went off the beaten path for a bit, and defeated this ghost flame dragon and was rewarded with the Great Katana. The Great Katana is one of my new favorite weapons in the whole game, and this is a weapon that will become a substitute for my Dark Moon Greatswords if the need ever arose or if I just felt like having some fun. So I went back to the round table hold, leveled it up to its maximum capacities, and pushed on eastward, eventually reaching the outskirts of Castle Ensis, and it's here that I really took a second to take things in. Dozens of corpses run through by spears, a signal of Mesmer's crusade against the horn scent of the tower settlement, a warning that for those seeking glory, or a chance to stand by Kylie Mikola's side, turning back is the only option for those seeking security. However, I hate myself, so I continued until I reached the gate of Castle Ensis, coming across another note from Leda. In this letter, Leda states that in order to burn the shadow tree blocking the path and keeping us from accessing the gate of divinity, a flame is required. Mesmer's flame. 
But before I figured out how to actually get into Castle Ensis, I went off the beaten path again, wanting to explore some more, and eventually I came across another NPC, Teolier, a practitioner in the art of poison who uses it as a means to compensate for his meekly frame and lack of strength, a fact that causes him to feel extreme feelings of inferiority and self-hatred. Curiously, when I decided to talk to more after meeting Teolier since he mentioned him before, he gave me a black syrup of some kind which Teolier used to create a potion that would clearly kill me if I chose to ingest it, so I left it in my inventory, but that wasn't the only NPC I came across. Bale! Vile Bale! Oh, terror incarnate! There is life in me yet! I will soon feast upon your heart! Mark my words! You too shall know fear! This is Egon, and he had something to say about someone or something named Bale. That this Bale is responsible for the destruction of his arms and legs, decimated by a conflict he clearly did not win. Curious about what lied onwards, I decided to go on ahead of Egon and got invaded by the ancient Dragon Man, but he was quick work. I could have continued going forward, but I ultimately recognized the mistake in this, that whatever was beyond this point was clearly not something I was capable of tackling just yet, so I chose to continue on with Castle Ensis. Also by this point, I was able to get my Shadow Realm Blessing up to 3, which is nice. Now to actually proceed with Castle Ensis, you need to drop down here, then carefully proceed along this pathway until you reach a point where you're actually inside Castle Ensis and you can rotate this wheel to open the front gate. Now of course, I didn't know this initially, so part of the reasons I even encountered these NPCs in the first place was because I thought this could be a way inwards. Somehow, I was wrong. The area was just so dark, I couldn't see all too well. Really one of those moments, huh? Anyway, I pushed through Castle Ensis, beat up this NPC and got her sword, and eventually got to the Castle Lord's Chamber. And beyond this fog wall lies our next main boss, Rolana, the Twin Moon Knight. And this is easily my second favorite boss within the entirety of the DLC. Fun moves and combos to interact with, and pretty strong yet tight timings for attacks. This fight is so cool. Most of Rolana's combos end with her doing a sort of cross slash, but typically you can dodge towards her instead of outwards for a punish. One of the things Rolana likes to do is that she likes to do a sort of dash around you before she initiates a string, similar to Melania. But Rolana actually stays in this animation for quite a few seconds, giving you ample reaction time to dodge through whatever she does next. Another thing Rolana likes to do is this quick two hit slash combo, and I found that the best way to dodge this, for me, without taking a hit, is by dodging to her right hip as opposed to her left. Whenever I would dodge to her left, it would hit me, but when I managed to dodge to her right, it wouldn't. Maybe this has something to do with my timing, I don't know, but this was the best way I found to dodge the active hitbox. Now of course, because this is Renala, Queen of the Full Moon's sister, she will also make use of Karian magic throughout the fight, but these act more as feints to set up her next attack. As you can see, during this attempt, I made use of my Great Katana, and I was able to proc several bleeds that got Renala to well below 50% meaning that we basically hit the threshold for her second and third phase transitions in a flash. During her transition into phase two, she creates a giant great sword with Kari and magic, doing two really fast swings, but honestly, once you get the timing down, this is pretty easy to dodge. But when her third phase transition hits, her twin swords will alight with both Kari and magic and flames as well. Usually when she enters this phase, she does one of two moves, but the one that she did for me the most is when she tossed out five projectiles at once. From my own personal experience, dodging all of them successfully does depend on the spacing of where you are in proximity to Rolana when she fires them. During this phase, most of Rolana's strings are basically the same, only the catch here is that all of them have flames and explosions attached to them, similar to Moog's blood flame explosion, but the way to dodge them is still the same, inwards, not outwards. The most deadly attack she has in this phase though is her twin moons, where she summons two moons which hit the ground before Rolana herself follows them up with an attack of her own. Normally you'd think to dodge through this, but the easiest way to avoid this attack entirely is simply just jump three times. Rolana is one of the coolest fights, not just in the DLC of Elden Ring, but in Elden Ring as a whole. And after some back and forth between Rolana and myself, I was able to defeat the twin moon knight.
This took me like 30 minutes, by the way. Since I had defeated Rilana, I decided to pick up her armor and weapons from the round table hole to see what they were like. Now, while I didn't end up using her weapons despite how cool they are, what I did end up rocking was Rilana's armor. Her armor is so sick, and this is the first time since I first played Elden Ring two years ago that I changed my armor once I got access to the Blight Cloak. That's how cool I think Rilana's armor set is. But with the ability to press on, we reach the Skadu Altus, and I immediately make my way towards this cross where I get this emote, May the Best Win, as well as this note telling me where I can make use of this. Also, Leta and the Horn Sun are here. The Horn Sun ended up giving me another map piece detailing the whereabouts of Mikola's crosses, while Leta told us that Mikola's charm placed on her and her allies has kept them from coming to blows, and she gave us some pretty important lore in regards to Mesmer's crusade against the Horn Sun. Apparently, Queen Merica herself ordered Mesmer and his forces to eradicate the Hornsen, a cleansing by fire. And although what happened to their kind was a shame, they were never saints, and that Mesmer's tyranny may have been justified, as man is a creature of conquest. And in this regard, the Hornsen were no different. But instead of continuing on with the Skadu Altus, I felt that after I defeated Rilana, I was more than capable of handling whatever lied beyond where Egon was. So I headed back there and entered into this dungeon, fought the ancient dragon man again, and was rewarded with the Dragon Slayer's Great Katana. This thing is so cool. It has the same move set as the regular Great Katana, but its special move is literally a Getsuka Ten show. So you already know I maxed this thing out immediately and eventually ended up in the Jagged Peak. And not even seconds upon entering the Jagged Peak, I got one shot by this Jagged Peak Drake. I was able to get my run back literally a couple minutes later on my second attempt, but because I got one shot literally one time, this told me that I needed to collect more Shadow Tree Fragments. So I promptly grabbed the Grace and decided to explore a bit more of the Shadow Altus. This journey took me eastward as I not only found this Mikola Cross, but I also ended up finding the person that I needed to use the May the Best Win emote on. I swiftly bonked him to death and was rewarded with the Dry Leaf Arts. Now, although I don't ever use these things, I just think it's really cool and also a little bit funny to see your character just ditch any type of real weapons and just use the only true reliable weapons a person has. From here, I ended up fighting another Ghost Flame Dragon, found the Fortress of Reprimand where I ended up finding the Iris of Occultation, an important item for later. I performed some platforming in order to reach the Bonnie Village, and I ended up finding the O Mother emote, which will also be important for later. And it's from here I ended up seeing a really unique sight, the sight of Mikola's great rune breaking and that with this, the charm placed on each of the NPCs in the Realm of Shadow was lifted. I was curious about what each NPC thought about this so I spoke to each of them individually and a lot of things were revealed. With Mikola's enchantment no longer clouding his memories, Ansbach spoke about how Moog was actually charmed by Mikola into acting on his hatred of the Golden Order, leading to Moog kidnapping him in order to establish his Moogwin dynasty. But it was by manipulating Moog's hatred that allowed Mikola to enter the Realm of Shadow in the first place, and that although he had tried to confront Mikola once before, Ansbach was ultimately incapable of fighting Mikola due to his ability to manipulate the hearts of men and women. It would appear that Mikola isn't who we thought he was to begin with, and Ansbach, rightfully terrified, wants to get as far away from here as he can. Believe me, I would too. Moore spoke about how him and his forager brood were abandoned and that Mikola's love helped keep them stable. I told him to put things behind him and he came to believe that Mikola's love is meant for those who are unloved. I spoke to the Horn Scent, who decided to head to Mesmer's Shadow Keep in order to settle the score between him and the man who led the crusade against his race. Leta spoke about how, even though she was no longer charmed, she still wished to serve Mikola to the fullest, and thought this to be an opportunity to call those whose loyalty to him would waver, and she revealed her plan to kill the Horn Scent as she also headed towards Mesmer's Shadow Keep. I spoke to Teolier, who had a similar revelation to Ansbach and the Horn Scent that memories of his beloved Saint Trina, a being that appeared to people in their dreams, had started to resurface, and he had revealed that this Saint Trina is actually Mikola's other half. Finally, I spoke to Freya, who probably had the most interesting tidbit of knowledge to share. Apparently, before even the events of the game took place, Mikola and Radon entered into a vow of some sort. And Freya, feeling some level of responsibility as one of Radon's former soldiers, has also decided to head to the Shadow Keep in order to figure out what this vow might have entailed. A vow with Radon? But we killed them, right? Does Radon have some part to play in Mikola's ascension to godhood? Uh! 
What was that? An omen of the future? A vision of what's to come? But I must be going crazy because there's no way what I saw was real. Is there? Anyway, after all my questing, I ended up reaching a Shadow Realm Blessing of 5, so I decided to head back to the Jagged Peak. I let these two dregs battle it out, and then found Egon again, who saw me steal one of the dragon's kill, and presumed me to be a fellow Drake warrior like him. I don't know how to tell you this Egon, but personally, I'm more of a Kendrick fan myself. But Egon had one final request to make of me, to scale the Jagged Peak, find Bale the Dread, and summon his soul for one last valiant effort against the creature that stole his dignity. Before advancing though, I explored more of the area, coming across this area for dragon communion and spoke to the priestess. She told me that Bale, the oldest and vilest of all dragons, saw himself superior to the dragon lord Placidusax. They challenged each other to a fierce battle and left each other with severe wounds, and Bale and the rest of his race of dragons, the drakes, were exiled to the jagged peak. She also spoke about Egon and about how he pursued the strength of dragons, only to be severely humbled by Bale. Wanting to explore more of the area, I came across Karos' hidden grave, as well as the Cerulean Coast, and I gotta say, these are easily some of the best looking areas in the whole game, especially the Cerulean Coast. Blue is my personal favorite color, so an entire area coated in blue flowers was so aesthetically pleasing to me. But after some exploration, I headed back to the Jagged Peak to scale the mountain and fought the ancient dragon Cenisax, and this fight sucks. What's worse than a dragon boss with high damaging lightning? A dragon boss with high damaging lightning surrounded by water. I hated every single minute that I spent on this boss and it deserves no more time than I'm giving it now. And I continued pushing up the mountain until I reached the peak, reaching an enclave surrounded by red flowers. There's only one boss that could be here. It's time to give Egon the justice he rightfully deserves. Curse you, Bale! I hereby vow you will rue this day! Solid of scale you might be, foul dragon! But I will riddle with holes your rotten hide. Behold, a true Drake warrior! Bale the Dread is one of the coolest boss fights in the whole Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC, and he's also one of the hardest. Because this is a dragon boss, the best way to fight him is to stay under him, or rather, near the side of his tail since the hitboxes on certain attacks don't always involve him thrusting his body forward, meaning that certain attacks will just whiff if you're under him or near the side of him. However, when he does thrust his body forward like when he goes for a bite, you can just do a dodge roll once you see his whole body move. But Miyazaki is just as vile as Bale is, so Bale specifically has a fire attack that targets underneath him. So keeping his tail like I mentioned lets you get some distance from him when you know he's gonna start charging this up. Be prepared though because Bale is mean and he'll definitely do this move multiple times during your own fights, I know that he did for me. Once you've depleted about 75% or lower of Bale's HP, he'll start summoning lightning, but you can simply just run away from this. But after a little bit more damage is done to him, we move into phase 2, where Bale grows back his wings. This is so cinema. It's cinema. I love cinema. But once Bale summons back his wings, he'll start flying around, summoning fireballs before eventually crashing back down to the ground. To dodge this, I run to the side, which lets me dodge the fireballs. As soon as the fireballs are gone, I would immediately start running towards Bale and then dodge to the side as he would come crashing down. This is the best way I've personally found to dodge this move, since dodging inwards or outwards has always gotten me hit, even when I would delay my roll to the last second. From here, Bale will generate large explosions with his attacks, whether it be through ground stomps or attacking with his arm. And the best way I've found to dodge either of these is that since the explosion on his ground stomp comes a couple seconds after, I simply just gotta time my dodge there, and when he attacks with his arm, you just jump. But the single most damaging attack Bale has is when he starts flying around, going crazy shooting beams of lightning. This is the attack I was the most scared of, as it had killed me during several runs and had me looking up at the sky, praying that he would never do this. 
but eventually I found that the best way to dodge this move is to start running forward whenever Bale would leap into the air, and whenever he would start shooting his beams I would keep running, dodging through any beams that could hit me, and generally speaking, this strat worked really well as it got to a point where some of the beams didn't even hit me and I was basically able to wrap around Bale and even attack his head for some extra damage. Bale the Dread took me about an hour or so, but after that hour, I was able to smite the vilest of all dragons. Egon, I will carry your legacy as a man pursuing strength as I continue through to the end of Shadow of the Earth Tree. With Bale's defeat, I decided to continue exploring the Cerulean Coast since I didn't get a full grasp of the place before. This would bring me to the Stone Coffin Fisher, and it's here that I came across an NPC who spoke about Mikola, but more specifically, whether or not he could offer salvation to others when he could not even save his other half. This meant that somewhere deep inside this area is where I would find Saint Trina. Determined to locate her, I continued through the fissure until I reached this area where I had to take a leap of faith, and ended up in this very clear boss arena where I entered into a fight with the Putrescent Knight. And in stark contrast to Bale, this fight wasn't that bad. I also like the fact that he reminds me a little bit of the Orphan of Cause from Bloodborne, mainly due to the weapon he wields. The Putrescent Knight is slow, and most of his attacks are pretty easy to roll through. And the main attack string he does is when he leaps off of his horse and attacks you with his weapon, with his horse following him up until the knight leaps back on. Once he reaches about 50% of his HP, we move into phase 2, and it's here that he starts making use of Frostbite, but literally just jump and you can avoid it. I thought this boss was going to take me a lot longer than it did, but I ended up securing the W on my second try. With the win secured, I entered into this enclave and found Saint Trina, and I love her design, and the lore surrounding her is amazing. Like what's been established already, Saint Trina is Mikola's other half, similar to Merica's relationship to Radagon, and is the physical embodiment of Mikola's love, which he had abandoned. But given how Mikola was cursed with eternal youth, and that Saint Trina was seen as both a boy and a girl at times when she appeared to others, we can infer that she's his youth affliction given bodily form as well. And when Mikola abandoned her and she fell into the stone coffin fissure, in order to sustain herself, she bonded with a nearby flower, and her blood not only polluted the surrounding area but mutated into something able to kill others. So I did what any normal person would. I took a sip of that good stuff. It killed me. But in typical FromSoft fashion, this simply meant I needed to take that good stuff again. Until this happened. Saint Trina has tasked us with stopping Mikola before he can ascend to godhood. Remembering Teolier's obsession with Saint Trina, I told him about her whereabouts, headed back there, and imbibed the nectar two more times, which led to Saint Trina stating that godhood would be Mikola's prison and that we must kill him, as Mikola has renounced everything that once made him human to tread the path of godhood to begin with. I chose to relay these words to Teolier, who was in denial about us being able to hear her whereas he could not. I reloaded the area and had no choice but to take him down. I tried to toss some sense into him, hoping that this time he would get the message, but he wouldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that his lovely Saint Trina, the embodiment of hope for her most devoted followers, would ask us of such a deed. And yet in his final moments, he contemplated that just maybe things weren't what they seemed to be. I'm sorry it had to end this way, dear comrade. May you hear Saint Trina's voice in your everlasting slumber. And may we meet again on the battlefield when fate demands it. Now, I wasn't going to include this part in the video, but once I went through this area, I had no choice but to. See, I wanted to explore more of the areas and see if maybe I missed any items, which led me to this dungeon near Bellarat. The reason why I felt like including this part specifically is because this guy speaks about not wanting to be put in the jar, so to speak. And this ended up being my first introduction to these things, the true nature of the Jar people. And with this, things have become clear in regards to Mesmer's Crusade. 
In the Bonnie village, you can find several greater potentates, all being horn sent, and their blades were actually used to dismember a culture of people known as the shamans in order to stuff them into jars and forcibly meld their flesh together with others in order to manufacture their own saints. Saints like Saint Trina. But what does Merrick have to do with this? Well, we'll have to figure this little inquiry out later, but the answer is right there. We just need the evidence to prove it. Also on my way back, I ended up finding the Cathedral of Manus Metir and entered into the service of Count Emir, who gave me this map and said I was destined for greatness, and even gave me some great lore about how humanity came to be. Near him is his servant, Yolan. She's not that important for now, but she will be later. However, I didn't feel like tackling this side quest just yet, so I kept this in the back pocket for now. With these last minute sights being seen, it's time to finally raid Mesmer the Impaler's Shadow Keep. And not even two seconds in entering this place, I am being forced against my will to fight this golden hippopotamus boss. You can actually find some of these guys spread throughout the Shadow Realm and they actually drop Shadow Tree fragments. However, this one is special because for some reason they decided to give a hippo boss a second phase. To put things briefly, this boss sucks and is easily one of the three worst fights in the DLC by far. Terrible hitboxes all around and is just not fun to fight. Honestly, I just bonked him to death, and once he hit the second phase, he powers up to Super Saiyan 3 for some reason. I ended up just running away to avoid whatever he threw at me and just kept bonking him until he died. I really do not care about this fight at all to go any more in depth with it, same like with Senesax in the Jagged Peak. But from here, I pushed onwards and eventually came across this summon sign, and I decided to help the Horn Scent fight off Leta, since beating her rewards you with the Swift Slash Ash of War. I don't make use of it at all, but it is nice to have since I won't have to do this later. As I continue with the Shadow Keep, I ended up going the wrong way and found myself in the ancient ruins of Rau completely by accident, thinking that this was the way to unlock part of the map that had been eluding me for hours. I fully understood I was not supposed to be here the moment I came across another letter from Leta speaking about how in order to burn the ceiling tree, we specifically do in fact need Mesmer's Flame. But since I was already here, I decided to see what this area had in full for me, stopping before the main boss of this area to save it for later. Also during my travels, I came across another Divine Beast Dancing Lion for some reason? Yeah, I have no idea why this one is even here at all. I thought they were mostly extinct, and this one is just chilling here for some reason. Now, under normal circumstances, I will fight him normally, but the difference with this lion compared to the one we fought in Bellarat is that this one sucks now. For some reason, this lion is capable of using Death Blight, which if you're not aware, is a status effect that instantly kills you once the bar fills up. But not only that, he's also capable of summoning basilisks, these weird bug-eyed creatures that are capable of inflicting death blight on the player as well. The things I could compare this boss fight to would get me kicked off of this site, but let's just say I hate the idea of this with every fiber of my being. And so, I did what any sensible person would do. I cheesed the hell out of him. I stood from the security of this surface and shot at him with poison and scarlet rod bolts until he died. You think I care about fighting fair? When the developers themselves are conspiring against me? Absolutely not. This is me evening the playing field, and I have no regrets about my actions. These lions deserve to go extinct. Mesmer was a hero. We just couldn't see it. <clears throat> Sorry, I broke character again. You know, I'm breaking character a lot during these videos now that I think about it. Maybe hard games aren't for me. I actually don't know. Anyway, with my exploration of Raoul done, I decided to head back to the Shadow Keep to finish what we started there. But I really quickly decided to grab the map piece that I was looking for since by this point it was killing me that I didn't have it. I reached the first floor of the specimen storehouse and made my way towards the fourth floor where I came across another cross and another note as well. And the note stated that there's actually a way to reach the base of the Shadow Tree from somewhere inside the Shadow Keep. Also by this point, I snagged some pretty sick gear from Mesmer's underlings, so I decided to rock that for a bit. And as I continued through the Shadow Keep, I came across a secret rite scroll of sorts, which detailed that a lord will usher in a god's return, and that that lord's soul will require a vessel of some sort. I kept this in the back of my mind until I reached the Dark Chamber, and you already know who lies beyond this door, but I didn't want to fight him just yet. I wanted to save him for closest to last as I can. So I decided that from here, my next course of action would be to find the way to the base of the Shadow Tree, bringing me towards the alternate entrance to the Shadow Keep. There's actually two paths here that take you to two different areas in the Shadow Keep, and the one that I decided to take took me back to the specimen storehouse, but a different part of it than before. 
Also, during my exploration, I came across both Freya and Ansbach. Now, I had a bit of a goof here, since you're actually supposed to talk to Freya first and then Ansbach in order to get her full dialogue, but don't worry, I've got you guys covered. Ansbach spoke about how after our own battle with Moog, his body disappeared, and after giving him the secret right scroll we found earlier, he realizes that Mikola only ever desired Moog's body to use as a vessel to house the soul of his king consort. Now Freya has the most interesting dialogue here. See, if you speak to Ansbach after talking to Freya first, he'll give you a letter, and by giving this letter to Freya, the truth will finally be revealed. Mikola wishes to revive Radon's soul in order to have him serve in his new age of compassion as his king consort, and plans to use Moog's body to house it. I think I'm starting to see just who the final boss is going to be. Looks like that vision from earlier was right, and may God have mercy on my poor soul. Still, even if I know who the final boss is by now, we've still gotta get there first, and there's still plenty of DLC left to explore. I eventually came across this lift, which took me down to the Shadow View, where we entered into a fight with Commander Gaius. I had heard horror stories about this fight and how his charge move is broken and like it's stupid for sure, but besides that, most of his moves aren't that difficult to dodge at all. If you ever end up behind him, his boar will do a back kick, but it's honestly pretty slow from my perspective, and he usually only does short combos, and even when he uses gravity magic and summons rocks, all that it takes is a quick dodge roll to the side. Phase 2 is where things start getting a bit dangerous as Gaius will start pulling out moves similar to Radan, more specifically him and his boar leaping into the air, doing a series of spins before crashing down into the ground, and this makes sense since him and Radan studied gravity magic together and were rivals, but while this looks scary, all this took was dodging into him once when he crashed down. Besides this, he'll also pull out black holes and whatnot, but most of his moves are still the same. It's really the charge that's annoying, but besides that, I was able to beat Gaius on my second try. This place is actually important though, so we'll be back later. From here, I took the path that I neglected from the back entrance earlier, which led me to being able to drain the water in the Shadow Keep, which brought me to the base of the Shadow Tree, where we ended up fighting the Shadow Tree Avatar. This is another one of my least favorite fights in the DLC, not because this fight is hard or anything, but mainly because I find the fight to be really boring. For starters, this thing is really just a giant sunflower, but more than that, this thing has three phases for some reason. Out of all the cool fights that FromSoft could have designed to have three phases in this DLC, this was the one they went with? I don't know, that's really underwhelming when you think about it. To talk about the fight itself, the head is the part of its body that takes the most damage, so most of my attacks are aimed there. Outside of that, the Sunflower's main combo usually consists of two really slow hits, and most of the branches and weeds it tries to attack you with build bleed so dodging is a must, and this is the only attack I find dodging to be a bit annoying. Once its full health bar has been depleted, it enters into a poise break state, and attacking it while it's in this state reduces its health when it revives itself. I think anyway, I'm pretty sure this is the case since it spawned back in with less health when I fought it, but I could be wrong, I don't know, I'm not smart. And in second phase, the new attack it adds to its arsenal is a charge attack that it does three times. But besides that and the fact that it's a bit tankier now, things are basically the same and the same goes for the third phase, where it gains a new explosion attack that requires a well-timed dodge, and creating this explosion leaves the sunflower in a vulnerable state for damage. Like I said before, this boss isn't hard, just a really boring gimmick boss. Although I had conquered both Gaius and the Shadow Tree Avatar by this point, I still didn't want to face Mesmer just yet, so I decided to tackle the rest of Count Ymir's questline, which brought me to the Finger Ruins of Rhea. I sounded the bell, spoke to Count Ymir again, and he gave me another map as well as some insight into Mikola's understanding of the internal corruption of the Golden Order, and how it all boils down to Merica and the fingers that guided her. Now, to reach the net set of finger ruins, this is where the O oh Mother emote comes in handy. See, back near the shadow view, if you head off to the right, there's a Marcus statue just sitting there. By using the O oh Mother emote in its vicinity, this will unlock the path to the hinterland, and more importantly, the finger ruins of Deo. But before I left this place, I came across the most beautiful sight in the game.
This is the Shaman Village, my absolute favorite area in the whole game, even though nothing of note really happens here. It's a deserted place, yet one filled with beautiful flowers, and in the middle of them, a minor ur tree, and to the top of this hill, a golden braid, a symbol of America's desire to become a god, and an offering to some sort of grandmother. And it's here that Elden Ring's main menu theme plays as well. The Shaman Village tells a story of tragedy. This was America's home. Her people, her culture, were violated by the horn scent, dismembered and forced into jars for the sake of their own ambitions. It's no wonder America chose the path of godhood. It was the only way to prevent something like what happened to her people from happening to anyone else. And the minor herd tree in the village's center was one that America herself placed as a way to commemorate and honor the people that she lost and restore some level of dignity to her village, even though there was no one left to be affected by this act of grace. It seems to me like Mesmer's tyranny wasn't truly tyranny at all, but an act of justice for a dead people. This is also a great area to just unwind and take a quick breather before returning to action. And I did just that. Once I had taken in enough of the sights here, I went back to Count Emir and he gave me one more map and one last piece of insight. That although America had done many unjust things under the guidance of the Two Fingers, responsibility lies with their mother. From here, I reloaded the area and Count Emir was gone, but I was actually able to access the final set of finger ruins by touching a secret button on his chair. I slid down the ladder, made quick work of this NPC who happened to be Yolan's sister, and then sounded the final bell bringing me to the boss arena of Metir, the mother of all two fingers and finger creepers, and the one I assume to be the being that Merica made an offering to via her golden braid. This is without question my least favorite fight in the whole DLC. The middle of her chest is the area that takes the most damage, so that's where I focus most of my hits. But the thing about this boss is that if you ever end up on its side, it's going to use its fingers to either swat you away or crawl all over you. And this evokes a primal rage out of me. I hate this! Her moves themselves aren't even that bad until you reach the second phase since her lasers, slams, and ground pounds aren't even that hard to dodge. But once we hit the second phase, she pulls out a black hole followed by a giant explosion. But she not only does this, but can surround the entire area in even more black holes, black holes that are very hard to see, and fires off a giant, seemingly undodgeable laser that rotates around three times. Now, I think you actually can dodge this by getting in as close as you can to her without entering her AoE range, and then just run around that way, but it's really hard, and I'm not good at it. And honestly, I just wanted this fight to be over so bad that once she ended up dissolving into her own black hole, I felt nothing but joy and happiness. Now, there's one last thing we need to do to cap off this quest. Once we return back to the cathedral, we can press the button on Count Ymir's chest to get invaded by Yolan. We beat her, and then immediately after, enter into a fight with Count Ymir himself, who has become a mother of fingers. I didn't think I'd be fighting two bosses back to back that give birth, but here we are. Thing is, Ymir is still an NPC, so he was just a pushover. Once this is done, we can talk to Yolan, and by giving her the Iris of Occultation, we can get her weapon, the Sword of Night. I never ended up using this thing, but it's really nice to have, and the weapon art is awesome. After this, I wanted to fill up the last area of the map that I was missing. To get to where I needed to go, I needed to go back to the area where I fought Leta, and then drop down and head to the left, until I found this ladder. Once I found this painting, I rolled into this hidden wall, jumped inside this coffin, and ended up in this new area. And there's a really cool thing you could do here by chucking a heavy furnace pot into this furnace golem to revive him and move him out the way and it's in this hidden area you can get the stone sheathed sword. And this sword is pretty interesting because of the fact that it has two forms it can take, as it can become the sword of light or the sword of darkness depending on what altar you bring it to. I remember there was an altar in Ra'u, so I brought it there after realizing that the floor was just invisible the whole time and turned it into the sword of light for fun. From here, I went back to the area I was in, pushing forward until I reached this dungeon, and at its end was a boss fight against Inquisitor Jory. Outside of the fact that he summoned several spectral avatars, this guy is a pushover, and I continued a little bit onwards until my spectral steed got scared. Torrent, the horse that had fought with me side by side against gods and things beyond my comprehension, my companion was scared. Whatever lied in this area was something I definitely did not want to deal with, but I had no choice. My curiosity was at its peak. I needed to see exactly what could have made Torrent so frightened. And as I pushed forward through the abyssal woods, 
I understood exactly what that was. Madness, and lots of creatures embodying that madness surrounding the area. The Abyssal Woods takes Elden Ring and transforms it from a normal game into a survival horror game where unless you're really good at parrying, you cannot harm these guys specifically, and must sneak by them. Also, as a result of all of my traveling and beating all these bosses, I ended up with a Shadow Realm blessing of 12 by the time I got here. But with all that being said, I successfully snuck past all the enemies, came across this really disturbing site, and ended up in Midra's Manse, where I got an unsettling welcome, to say the least. As you progress through Midra's manse, you get an understanding as to what happened here. Midra, the lord of the manse, aspired to become a lord of frenzied flame, but ultimately failed and was sentenced to eternal torment by the Inquisitors, a group of Hornsen. This tragedy not only befell him, but also his lover, Nanaya, who we find cradling his spine in the form of a torch, with a dying flame of frenzy acting as its fire. And we learn that in the past, Nanaya told Midra to endure his punishment, believing he would be given salvation one day. Eventually we come across Midra himself, defeat him, and he promptly rips his head off using the barbed sword protruding from his body, and from his remains, a lord of frenzied flame has been born. Despite being a really cool character and tragic as well, Midra is pretty easy. He usually begins the fight by spreading his madness across the arena, and I make sure to get up close to him since you want to be in close proximity to him like other bosses. His main attack consists of this pretty easy 3 hit combo as well as him doing a series of spins, but dodging into both, especially the spins, lets you get away successfully. When Midra begins spewing more madness, because we're close to him we can either strafe to the side or dodge and the flame won't hit us. Once we've done about 75% of his life, we move into phase 2, signaled by Midra rising into the air before creating a giant explosion as he crashes back down. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to run away from this in order to not get hit, but he always ended up catching me as I was running away, so maybe I was just doing it wrong? I don't know. But besides this and Midra now shooting out waves of frenzied flame with his sword, which you can either jump or dodge to the side, him creating madness bombs or his new 5 hit combo which is pretty well telegraphed, I was able to defeat him on my second try and really, it might have been my first had I not sold for content. For as cool as a character as he was, Midra was pretty underwhelming in terms of difficulty as I was able to swiftly end the newly emerged Lord of Frenzied Flame. Still a fun fight for what it was, and I'd like to dedicate time to getting better at this fight should the time arise. But with the defeat of Midra, we've defeated every remaining main boss in the DLC outside of whatever lies beyond this fog wall in Ra'u, and the final boss of the DLC. Meaning that at long last, it's finally time to confront the Lord of the Shadow Keep and the poster child of Shadow of the Ur Tree. Mesmer the Impaler is without a doubt my favorite boss in all of Elden Ring, even including the base game. Mesmer is representative of everything that I love in good boss fights. He's hard but extremely fair, and none of his attacks feel overwhelming and are all fun to dodge and learn. He's incredible. When the fight begins, Mesmer will rise into the air creating an orb of fire as he eventually comes crashing back down. You need to do two dodge rolls here, one to dodge Mesmer and another to dodge the explosion that the orb creates a couple seconds after. Given that his epithet is the Impaler, Mesmer wields a spear as his primary weapon and predicates a lot of his attacks around using his spear in tandem with his flames, typically ending a string by doing a full rotation surrounded by them, but will also do a shorter series of combos here and there, like doing two faster slashes or by doing a super delayed slash, followed by him doing a thrust. You need to time your dodge really well for the first attack, don't get hasty. Then for the thrust, I run to his side and then dodge once he extends his spear. When it comes to his longer combos, because the hitboxes of the flames extend outwards, dodging inwards is best. I find all of Mesmer's strings to be pretty easy to dodge, especially when Mesmer rises into the air, does a slash, then does a series of rapid thrusts before slamming into the ground and producing more spears. 
When he gets to the second part of the combo, dodging inwards is advised. And of course, much like with Mesmer's Orb, dodging the next part of the combo requires two dodges at the same time as well. Mesmer will also do a series of spins before rising into the air and coming back down, but to dodge this, I dodge into him when he begins the attack, and then do another dodge outwards to dodge the rest of his spins, then I do two dodges inwards. Mesmer also has a command grab, and the best way I've found to dodge this is to wait for when I hear Mesmer's footsteps, and this has acted as a really good audio cue during my attempts of the fight. Mesmer is an extremely fun and fair boss, and that pattern continues as we eventually move into phase 2 after reducing half of his life. I will not suffer. A lord devoid of light. No oh, mother, forgive me. be taken in the jaws of the abyssal serpent shorn of light. In phase two, Mesmer has broken the seal of grace Marika constructed in place of his eye in order to call upon the power of the abyssal serpent within him, and as the base serpent, Mesmer has added several new attacks to his arsenal while keeping most of his original attacks. And yet, everything is still fair and balanced and fun, a testament to why I believe this to be the best boss fight in the whole game. At the beginning of Phase 2, Mesmer will transform into a giant snake, utilizing the same orb from in Phase 1. Only here, the explosion is a bit more delayed, but you can actually attack the head of the serpent for damage. Like I mentioned, Mesmer retains most of his original strings. Only here, he tends to follow them up by lunging himself across the screen, given his added mobility. As the base serpent, Mesmer can of course summon snakes to assist him. Whether it be one snake at a time, transform into a snake and do three sets of bites, or do one really delayed bite. Mesmer can switch up on a dime on which snake attack he wants to use, but the tells for when and how to dodge these attacks are telegraphed very well to the player. The hardest attack to dodge in this phase is specifically when Mesmer will create an AoE around himself and then summon a legion of snakes before doing the same die from the first phase. Because Mesmer is guaranteed to do this attack at least at some point during the phase, I make sure to stay back whenever he does any other attack, and when Mesmer starts running up, he'll either follow this up by doing a slash or the AoE, and when he does the AoE, I typically try to dodge left and right, but this is probably the only attack I'm not really good at dodging, since it's a bit hard to tell when the snakes are coming my way. Thankfully, the last part of the combo is still pretty easy to dodge. It was a long road to get to this point, and all I can say is this, Mesmer the Impaler, you were magnificent, and I will never forget you. So uh, you guys want to know a little fun fact about all this? See, what's funny about this is that this wasn't my only victory against Mesmer. See, I like this fight so much that through various unscrupulous means, I fought him another six times after my original winning attempt. 
You might be questioning why I would even think to do this to myself instead of just progressing with the story to be done quicker, but the answer is pretty simple. I'm a masochist and pain fuels my desire to get better at these games. Also after this, I had to appropriate Mesmer's fit for myself. It's just so cool. I had no choice but to put it on. But now that I've completely conquered the Shadow Keep and obtained Mesmer's kindling, it's time to take care of the boss we left over in Raoult, Romina, Saint of the Bud. And I love the aesthetic of this fight. It's the only fight in the DLC that makes use of Scarlet Rot, and the design of Romina is awesome. One thing I really don't like though is how Romina and Relana as well have dialogue lines that were cut from the final product of Shadow of the Earth Tree which makes no sense. One of my main complaints about Shadow of the Earth Tree by this point is the lack of cutscenes and not placing enough importance on bosses like Romina and Relana despite them being main bosses and having some very important lore. I especially love Romina's voice as well is just weird. But with that being said, by this point in the DLC this fight was pretty easy. Romina attacks with a glaive of sorts, and most of her attacks are pretty well telegraphed. I did get caught off guard by her second phase trigger being an AoE as well as her producing explosive butterflies, but after everything I've been through at this point, Romina was just not strong to handle the powers of bonkage that I possess. With Romina's defeat, the time has come to burn the Shadow Tree, revealing the second layer of Bellarat, and near Elium. By this point, my Shadow Realm Blessing had reached 15, and I felt extremely confident in my ability to complete the DLC with what I had in my possession. I pushed forward until I encountered Letta again, who realized that we do not swear fealty to Mikola, and waits for us to challenge her and her compatriots. Now of course, I did say I wouldn't use summons for the run of the game, and I haven't up to this point, but given that Ansbach and Teolier wish to accompany me in a very clearly lopsided battle from the looks of it, this isn't so much summoning, but rather evening the playing field. Now, this fight is basically just a glorified NPC battle, and the power of Bonkage comes through like it has many times before, but I felt really bad about having to kill more specifically. He didn't really do anything wrong to me, and he told me he liked selling stuff to me, since he liked seeing me happy, but his desires for love meant more to him. Also, why did they give one of the worst encounters in the game some of the best music in the game? Miyazaki, we're taking you out back, gang. <laughs> but after beating the gang squad, I ended up getting all their armor pieces, including Letta's, and you already know I had to rock this going into the final fight. From here, I spoke to Ansbach one last time, who revealed that he knows about our involvement in Moog's demise, but he doesn't blame us for that, but rather what the enchantment made Moog do to begin with. To the end, Ansbach, you were a real one. All you wanted was to serve your master and honor his memory, and I'll carry that desire into this final battle to see that Mikola's ambitions are put to rest for good. My loyal blade and champion of the festival, both your deeds will ever be praised in song. Now, the vow will be honored. And my lord brother's soul will return, so that he may be my consort. Using Moog's body as a vessel for the remnants of Radon's soul, Mikola has brought him back from death in order to serve as his promised consort, and this fight is brutal. Radon does so much damage on every hit, and although all of his attacks have some level of windup which makes dodging things easier, there's one move that does feel like a complete and total oversight by Frunsoff, the three hit pincer combo. You've probably heard several people complain about this move by now, but this feels almost impossible to anticipate and dodge consistently since bosses don't always follow set patterns in this game. Like I've dodged it before, but it's really hard to get down to a consistent level. For the fight itself though, Radon will usually begin the fight by leaping into the air, doing a spin before eventually crashing down into the ground, and most of his attacks consist of a long series of slashes. 
When Radon rises up into the air and does a downward slam, I like to wait for a couple of seconds since Radon can follow this up by doing a second one. Because this is Radon in Moog's body, Radon also has access to Moog's blood magic, but here I dodge into the first hit, dodge the second slash, then go into a quick run, and usually this is enough to keep me safe. When Radon decides to utilize his gravity magic, he can do so in two ways. He can either roar and try to pull you in closer, or cover his great swords in gravity magic before leaping into the air and hurling rocks at you. For the first one, a simple dodge roll is enough, but it is pretty fast and hard to react to. For the latter, I dodge roll twice since Radon sinking his blade into the grounds and him leaping into the air count as individual attacks, and once he hurls the rocks at you, I run to the side and just jump. Radon is tanky, but with enough patience I was able to make it to phase 2, and this is where the real battle begins. Ay-yay-yay-yay-yay-yay, where do I even begin to dissect this part of the fight, man? This is easily the most volatile phase of any fight in this entire game. Tactical nukes that can make even the best PCs drop frames, lingering light effects that can stun lock you and lead to the end of a good run, a command grab that can automatically kill you if he grabs you twice, and almost nigh impossible to react to clones that act as roll bait for when Radon himself actually attacks. Add that to Mikola's ridiculously long hair taking up most of the screen and you have a fight that feels like a sweaty DPS race except your DPS is always lower all the time. But instead of just narrating over my best attempts at dodging his attacks and whatnot, I think it's best for me to just shut up and have you guys just take it all in for yourselves.
We're out of here! We're fucking out of here, baby! Elden Ring Shadow of the Earth Tree was a fantastic DLC. Obviously, I do think that this DLC had certain things that I wasn't a fan of, certain issues that I wish were not present, but overall, the quality of this DLC is fantastic. It really does feel like a whole other game, not just an expansion to Elden Ring, but it really does feel more than that. The areas are visually stunning, the bosses are awesome, especially Mesmer. Like I said before, he's easy become my favorite boss in this game, and not just my favorite boss in Elden Ring, but just one of my favorite bosses of all time. He's generally one of the most fun bosses I've ever had the pleasure of facing. But yeah, man, in general, Shadow of the Earth Tree was fantastic. And if you guys watched up to this point, Thank you so much. I wanted to try some variety. You know, I can't only play Kingdom Hearts. And if you guys like this video, let me know if you want to see any more Souls games. Up to this point, I've only actually played Elden Ring and Bloodborne. So let me know if you would like to see me play through any of the other Souls games. But with all that being said, thanks for watching and I'll talk to y'all later.